Hi, I'm Chris Nessie from the House of EdTech podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. And make sure to check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. And now, the learning begins in 3, 2, 1. Welcome to episode 59 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And in today's episode, we're going to take a look at something we really haven't talked much about here on the Tribe, and that is Google Photos. So Google Photos is a fantastic platform, and we want to give you some ideas on how you can use this on your campus and in your classroom. Uh, We will also, of course, have our Google News and updates. We're going to feature some feedback from all of you, as well as some questions and some posts from the blogosphere. So to kick off today's news and updates from Google, let's talk about talk. There is a post that Google put out recently called All Talk, No Type, 20 Things You Can Do With Your Voice. And I am a growing fan of using my voice for a variety of things. It seems like it's it's sort of a weird thing to some of us to talk to our phones I guess that's kind of what phones are for is to talk to, but um, to to talk to them, to actually get them to do things or to our, our computers. But talking to people is OK, too, though. Yes, that's true. I, I think I am a big fan of talking to people as well. But using some of these voice commands can really save us time. And so, um, of course, if you've got a Google Home at home, um, that's that's a place where you can definitely do that um, and just ask real simple questions. But then even when you've got your, your phone, you know, just asking Google to send a quick text or asking a quick question in class whenever you're at school, um, there are a whole bunch of commands that sometimes we don't realize. And in this post, it digs into three different places where you can use those voice commands. Uh, for instance, you've got for the home, uh, where it'll pull up uh, step-by-step baking instructions and, and a recipe, stuff like that. For the road, uh, you know, where it'll tell you how long it takes to drive to the closest Starbucks, which is an important one for Casey and I, I know. And uh, for fun, where it'll, you can even just ask, hey, Google, tell me something good, and it'll do it. That is super cool. You know, I am always telling people, you got to get used to talking to your stuff, because this is the way everything is working now. And it's great. It's going to help us. It's going to help kids, especially the kids who can't type very fast, to be able to use these voice commands in the various applications that we have. So I love that. You know, we also got a a really cool little update to Hangouts Chat. And I don't know how many of you use this, but I know a lot of people do keep group chats going for their schools and their teams and things like that so everybody can kind of check in. Well, I don't know if your chat looks anything like my chat, but I have so many notifications and so many groups that I'm in that I cannot possibly keep up. And the notifications can be really annoying, especially if it's not something you need to read immediately. So now you have the ability to snooze your notifications. So that's great. If it's not something that's, hey, it's not like a help desk issue. It's not an immediate thing, but hey, I need to read this. I just don't have time to do it right now. Just kind of like we can snooze our messages in Gmail. We can come back and and snooze our notifications in Hangouts. Uh, Another part of Google that I have loved for a long time is street view. And of course, what's great about it is you can take the little, the little yellow peg man on your uh, browser and drop him onto the map and be able to see things uh, the way that they look down on the street, just about anywhere around the world. And what's neat is that they're continuing to add new places and new images all over the world. And sometimes Google uses creative ways to do it. 
For instance, now there is this super volcano on the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. And so <laughs> clearly you can't use the Google car to just drive out to a super volcano. Um, in, Dang. Yeah, I know, right? That just kind of ruined your weekend plans, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sad, you know. But what they did was instead they took one of these uh, cameras, one of these like 360 panoramic cameras and stuck it on a boat. And so now you're able to tour this super volcano in Indonesia. So, you know, if something like this plays into the geography or the physical science or whatever that that works with your class, this could be a really, really neat option. So Google is letting us see more of the world as if we were right there uh, little by little as they add more of these street views. That's awesome. And what a great way to flatten the walls of your classroom. You know, we we talk so much about maps and street view, but I think our next topic is one that hits almost every episode, Matt. We almost always have an update from Google Arts and Culture. Yay, Google Arts and Culture. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I feel like we should have some little official like sound or signal for when we talk about arts and culture, but Yay, Google Arts and Culture. Yay. Yay, Yay Google Arts and Culture. Yay. Yay. It is one of my favorite little Google tools and we have a special post here and I have to tell you it's it's distracting me right now, but it is super cool. The title <laughs> of this post, by the way, which is from the keyword blog, no need to dig. Here are 20 treasures from Google arts and culture. And I am watching this brontosaurus. I think it's brontosaurus yeah. coming towards me um, as it, as it comes to life in this museum. And it's, it's pretty awesome. I kind of feel like it's a night at the museum kind of thing, but right. um, yeah. So, so they've shared, of course, we can't read all 20 to you today, but um, you know, they've shared all all of these just little highlights from Google Arts and Culture, you know, a lot of this connects back to things like Street View and expeditions and other things, too. There's a lot of crossover with these things. You can um, see a lot of 360 types of videos. They've got these high resolution, what they call gigapixel pieces of artwork and artifacts that you can zoom in on and like see the brush strokes. They have all kinds of historical uh, artifacts and photos. There's uh, the private home of of uh, Frida Kahlo, and they're showing uh, her personal life and the subject of many of her works. Um, there's space history, so that's that's where I like to really geek out and talk about the space shuttle discovery and tour discovery and virtual reality. Oh my gosh, where was this when I was ten years old? Right. <laughs> yeah. I was. Uh, yeah, this was this was awesome. So again, I can't read them all. They are in our show notes. All of the links and everything that we're talking about, you can get at googleteachertribe.com/slash. 59. I see what they're doing with the headline to this article here. It says, no need to dig. Here are 20 treasures because, you know, obviously you've got the dig with the artifacts and everything, but Google arts and culture is so broad and deep. It's hard to find things. And so this nice little curated collection can be just what you need to maybe plug something new into your classroom. Okay, y'all, are you ready to dig into Google Photos? So if you have not experienced the wonders of Google Photos, you can go to photos.google.com. Of course, it's a web app like most everything we do with Google, and it's very easy to use. Of course, it syncs with our G Suite accounts as well. And um, we've included lots of ideas and resources in our show notes. One of the first things that I I added here was also a link back to the support center. So if you're just getting started, I wanted you to have that resource so you know exactly how to get set up. And also want to mention that it works across devices. So there is a Google Photos app for iOS and for Android. So if you're just getting started, you definitely want to get those. Or if you have devices in your classroom, I know a lot of people are still working on iPads or maybe you've got um, the the new Chrome tabs and things like that running Android. So be sure that you install that. This is a, a great application with with a lot of, of reasons to use it in the classroom and, and beyond. You know, I think we tend to think of photos as sort of a personal thing, but I've used Google Photos for years personally just because it automatically syncs all of my photos on my phone to my Google account. Yeah, and that's... And that that's... saves... 
that mm-hmm. saves so much space. So I'm able to, you know, back it up there and you can have it set up to, to automatically sync. And I'll tell you that if that doesn't sell you on a reason to try Google Photos, it should, because the number one reason that that people's phones are full it is because they have so many photos and videos. So, um, yeah, so that's that's one one big reason personally to use it. But there's a lot of cool things that we can do with our students and on our campuses with this application. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, um, the the more that I use this in my in my own personal life, the more that I see, oh, my goodness, this could be really cool. Uh, one of the things that it will do is it creates animations. So it'll basically create an animated GIF, GIF, not going to have that fight today, <laughs> or one of the, the other, however you want to pronounce it. It will create one of those based on pictures that you take. And so I start to think about how how you could use that. And there's there's a variety of ways to to create those. Now, what's great with the Google Photos app is that it has the assistant and the assistant will find pictures that you take that are suitable for an animation. And sometimes it will create one for you. Like there's been a variety of times where I've taken a bunch of pictures of something of like my kids playing soccer or of us running around in the yard or us doing something silly in the house and it stitches them all together as one of those animations and I didn't even expect it. But what you can also do is you can create a new animation by selecting a bunch of those sequential photos and just having it stitch them all together. And so as as I start to brainstorm ways that this could that this could work in the class I think it would be great to show gradual change, you know, like change in the seasons. I've heard of some teachers that will take pictures outside their window as the seasons change. Like here in Indiana, we have a very distinct like summer to fall where we have the the color in the the trees and the leaves and then they fall off, of course. Um, What's that hey, like? <laughs> uh, <laughs> note that I said here in Indiana, we have it that way. Yeah, That is one of the beauties of living here is that we do have the four seasons. The sad part is that one of the seasons is winter and it's cold. <laughs> but, um, you know, taking pictures of that change and then stitching them all together into an animation could be really cool. Um, something else that works with that, too, that's that gradual change is the growth of plants or maybe animals like a class pet and you take pictures just little by little of something that's, that's growing and changing and it shows it. Um, Even rapid change works too. I remember when I very first learned about the Google photos app, it was actually uh, when I was with Casey in Austin, Texas at the Google teacher Academy. And uh, one of the things they challenged us to do was to create one of those animations. And one of the first ones we did with my group was we showed one of ice melting and so we just took a bunch of pictures of this, you know, we'd, we turned hot water on it and it melted pretty fast and we just click, 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 took those pictures. So, you know, let your mind go on that and being able to see those animations replay over and over and over and over again um, sometimes helps kids process and see it better than if they just watch it one time through. So there's a wide variety of things you can do with this, even beyond just demonstrating change like that. Right, Casey? Absolutely. So I love those ideas and seeing things grow. And, you know, I I actually don't know what the limit is on the length. So we are talking about a quick animation, but this could also mimic some of the things that we've been doing with stop motion. You know, I think too, yeah, you know, like telling a story. So a lot of people will do the whole like Lego scene. And so they could tell a story. Students could, you know, put together some sort of scene, whether that's with Legos or some other, you know, physical objects and have them move around. So, you know, that they could, you know, complete a task or they could come together and collaborate, whatever it is. But I'm using it basically to tell a story, probably an abbreviated story, (laughs) but, you know, to be able to use that. And, oh, thanks. You looked it up, right? Up Mm -hmm. to 50, up to 50 photos per animation. That's a lot. I didn't know it was that many. So that's fabulous. So there's, you know, there's so many ways that you can, you can do that. And of course, kids love animations and they love seeing them of themselves too. So you can have some fun with these, you know, I know a lot of teachers take pictures of their photo, uh, pictures of their photos, pictures of their students (laughs) and, and use those throughout the year. Some schools even require it. 
uh, that that the teachers are are doing that and sharing and posting and things like that. But you can also um, do a few more things, right? Yeah. You know, I was when you were talking about telling a story and even doing stop motion, if you're limited on those 50 photos, you could even put together multiple animations and stick them onto different slides in a Google slide presentation or something like that. So it could be, you know, you watch the first animation, watch it loop through a couple times, then flip to that next slide where it's got the next animation. And so you could put several of those animations together and make a pretty cool kind of like animated video story out of a whole bunch of those by smashing those two apps together by using photos and something like slides. That's that's also a, a really cool idea. We'll do a little app smashing there. Now, I do want to mention too, a lot of people um, may not know that you have the Google Photos app, but you can also get on your mobile devices, the Scan Photos app. So it will it will make it easier if you actually have physical photos that you want to scan. So it acts as a little scanner for you. So you can do that and bring those into your projects. Now, the assistant creates all kinds of things, not just the animations. And you'll get notifications when they automatically do it. It's always kind of funny to go back and watch those. They'll also do like revisiting, you know, two years ago or whatever. What happened on this day and. 2013 or whatever. I think I just got one of those this morning, in fact. But, um, you know, being able to scan those, but they also create collages and movies um, automatically. Sometimes those collages are pretty cool. And sometimes you may want to, you know, create your own to make sure you're getting the right ones in there. But there's a lot of ways that students can can use those those collages as well to tell a story that it doesn't have to be animated, but they can also sort of um, bring together their projects. And, you know, I think it's important to think about what pictures can mean in the classroom. And in terms of turning in in different types of assignments, because sometimes we struggle with ways to get more physical types of, of assignments into a digital format and snapping a picture is a great way to do that. So, you know, I know in some math classes and the, the teachers still have, you know, the students working out their word problems and things like that. So you obviously you can still have them take a picture so that you have the digital representation of that and, and you can evaluate that and assess it, you know, I think of like lab experiments and, you know, all kinds of things that they're building and creating and maker spaces and all of those things are lots of great things that that they can bring into the Google's the Google Photos application. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Those those collages can be pretty powerful. I wanted to follow up on the movies, too. Uh, What's neat about that is it basically lets you pull together a bunch of pictures and video clips into these movies. And so in these movies, you know, it's it's basically like a video that plays through and it'll display images every so often. And then it'll also play these video clips that you put in and you can order them so that they, you know, you pick the one that goes first and second and third and so on. You can decide how long they stay on the screen. And if there's a video clip, you can see which part of the video clip you want to show up. It'll even put some music back behind it for you too. So if you like the idea of doing either some storytelling or kind of a replay of the artifacts that you've captured in photos and videos uh, from a lesson, then this is a quick way to to demonstrate all of that. And the other thing I like too is that it will auto-create videos for you. So it's got different settings where, you know, for instance, for me, I've got three kids and whenever it seems like whenever one of them has a birthday or if I've taken a bunch of pictures or videos of one of them recently, it will go back. This is what's kind of amazing about this. Google Photos will go back and will find photos and videos where that person's face is in it because it's got face detection. Even if it doesn't know, you know, my child's name, if I haven't plugged that in there, it can still find those. And then it will show them as they grow up. It does it for cats and dogs. And it's got one for like the best smiles of the year. And so it'll find pictures or videos where where people are smiling. And so, you know, that may not have a ton of 
academic relevance, so to speak. But the other thing that's great about Google Photos is the more photos and the more videos you put into it, the more you can do with it. So if you're willing to take some photos of your classroom, of your students, and continually kind of like capture, capture, capture lots of stuff, then the neat things that it can let you do and create for you that's that's another sort of superpower of it. And then that can even turn into academic relevance because whenever students go look at that video that it auto created for you, it gives you a reason to go back to that day and go, oh, yeah, do you remember when we did that activity that day? That was so cool. What do you remember about it? Now they're doing that retrieval practice of what they've learned before, calling it back to mind, which sticks it into long term memory longer. So the more stuff that you capture the more that Google Photos can do for you and your students. Yeah, I love that because it gets smarter the more you use it, which yeah. happens to work that way in a lot of our, our favorite Google apps. You know, the other thing that I really like is the way that we can organize all of our photos in Google Photos, that we can organize and kind of curate things into albums. And so I do this, you know, on a personal level, we, I'll create albums for family vacations and and doing different projects. And then it will also sort of auto create some things for you too. It's kind of funny when I go back because mine creates a lot of albums for conferences and I can go back and see what happened, you know, when I was visiting a conference at this time last year and things like that. But you do have the ability to create those albums and, and share them in some really unique ways. So, you know, just to put this out there, like, like I mentioned earlier, I know a lot of teachers take pictures of their students uh, on a daily basis, whether that's something you're putting in Instagram to share, you know, with the community and with family. And sometimes it's something you just kind of keep private because you're going to share that with parents at the end of the year or some other format. Of course, we have lots of considerations in terms of protecting privacy as well. And that's that's something that you you definitely need to make sure that you understand what the the uh, acceptable use policy is for your school and, you know, the permissions and things like that. So a lot of times you can get permission to do that. And a lot of times schools say, no, that's not even an option. So just keep that in mind. Um, we realize that what we're sharing may or may not be something that every school can do, at least not with pictures of students. But once once you start creating those albums, um, you do have permission, you know, for parents to see, hey, look at all the cool stuff that's going on in you know, Mr. Miller's classroom and you can share those and, you know, you have lots of different sharing options, of course, like we do with, with Google and our, our options to, to share with individual emails, to share to an album, which could be a shared album. So Matt and I could collaborate and create an album together as well as just sharing on social media or getting a direct link. And so <laughs> this helps me out a lot when I, I try to share things with my sister. And she's like, I don't know how to open that. <laughs> and so I'll just give her the direct link. I'm like, she's like, just send me the link to the picture. So um, I have to, you know, I have to simplify a little bit my my process with, with some of those things. I'm like, I got the whole album here. And, um, but but it does make things easier. And, you know, I think even what we talked about in our last episode in episode 58 about e-portfolios, there's a lot of applications for using photos too. And so I think, I think that that's an opportunity. And then of course, not to forget about the fact that uh, students create all kinds of things throughout the year and it might be artistic. Um, you know, I think art teachers in particular would love Google photos for that reason and to allow them to collect those into different albums. And then you also have a bigger shared option called shared libraries. And so schools, campuses, even maybe like by grade level, you could create a shared library. And of course, I'm thinking, especially with like the seniors, you know, how awesome it would be to collect those and put those into one shared library for them to be able to access and then to take that with them when they go. You know, my wife does a uh, a regular trip to Washington, D.C. And so, you know, that makes me think, too, if you go on a big trip like that together for everybody to be able to share those photos together would be great. Um, there's one other little thing we want to mention real quick as we wrap this up. 
is that if you if you take some really great photos and want to do something a little more permanent than just hang on to them digitally, there is a way to create photo books. Now, of course, these aren't free. They're something that can be printed and held on to. And you, know, you could think of maybe like an end of the year photo book that gathers all of the all of the photos together, you know, maybe have a fundraiser to pull that together or have people, um, you know, parents or students be able to pay for them. Uh, if students create artwork or really anything and want to save it into something that's a little more tangible to hold on to through the years, this is another really cool option. So uh, lots and lots of things you can do with Google Photos. You know, I put this right up there with Google Keep of two things that I really use daily uh, in my own life. You know, keep photos, probably Gmail too. I'm not, I'm not as endeared to Gmail as I am to Google Photos and Google Keep. But, um, you know, this is this is one that can really be a useful thing, I think, every day in your life as you as you take more and more photos. So if you haven't checked it out, definitely do that. And we've got lots of links to uh, the things that we've been talking about in this episode at our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 59. There's a letter in your mailbox. Hey, you know what? This is all your mail. Hey, maybe I'll give you a call sometime. You've got mail. So let's take a quick dive into the mailbag. We've got a couple of things from all of you in the tribe, and we do love to get mail, <laughs> digital mail, voicemail, like on a voice message that you can leave at googleteachertribe.com. We do love uh, to hear your voices. Casey, we were just talking earlier about how we've been kind of sad that we've been a little lacking on hearing from people's voices, right? Oh, I'm not sad. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm disappointed oh, in, no. in the tribe. Yes. <laughs> yes. Shame. Shame. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, we really do love to have your voice, just like you love to hear our voices, which yeah. we, we had no idea people would actually like to hear our voices <laughs> when we started this. Right. But, you know, we like to hear that. And sometimes the questions that we get in other places are also a little bit harder to um, clarify. Yeah. And so when you can talk, we get a little more detail. And guess what? Everybody else loves to hear your voice too. They so do. we are we are begging you to leave us a speak pipe message. So if you would like to leave us a question or a message in the voicemail, the speak pipe format, you can go to googleteachertribe.com slash feedback. Yes, absolutely. So now let's, let's uh, touch on something that we talked about in our last episode. Since we were talking about Google Sites and ePortfolios, we talked about, we had a question about being able to leave comments for students or for whoever on a site. And we talked about how using Google Forms, you know, a Google Forms survey is one way to do that and then just embed the spreadsheet with the responses down below it. And that, that kind of does that same thing. We had several folks on Twitter reach out and say, you know, another way to really do this well is to embed a Padlet wall onto your Google site. So if you're not familiar with Padlet, I always kind of like to think of Padlet as it's kind of like a digital bulletin board or a digital cork board. And you can take a little sticky note and tack it on there. And so if you take one of those Padlet walls and you embed it onto your Google site, then anybody who comes would be able to stick one of those little notes. Now, Padlet isn't totally, totally free. So, you know, you might want to check into the the pricing and the way that all of that works to make sure that it'll do what you want to do. But that is a really cool way to make this work, I think. So thank you to all of you from the tribe for shouting out that idea. Yes, we had so many people who shared it that we really couldn't just give one particular shout out because then it would have just seemed unfair. And yeah. apparently that's a really big deal. So <laughs> we we love hearing from you in all different places. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Becky Saul right. on Twitter. She's at Beck Tech 99 and she just tweeted a really cool picture of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast logo on her Apple Watch. And so <laughs> it, it kind of glows. It just looks cool. And I hadn't seen one that I remember on a watch. You know, we've seen lots of car pics, too. So it is fun to see where you're listening to us, how you're listening to us and to share that mm -hmm. uh, with the tribe. So we we appreciate that. And we appreciate all of the loyalty that we receive from the tribe as well. Now, we did get uh, another 
question on the website that I, I think is an important piece to clarify. So a couple episodes ago, I guess it was episode 57, we talked about the updates to Google Classroom. And so one of the new features was the ability to copy a class. Sean Lane left us a question and said, I was so excited to hear that you can copy a classroom, but it seems to only be available in new classrooms. And yes, Sean, you are right. So um, thank you for that, that clarifying question here. But if you want to use that new feature and copy an entire class, which by the way, is on the classroom homepage, you'll click on the little three dots on your card, you know, where you see all of your classes and you'll see the option to copy, but you'll only see the option to copy on those classes that you have created since that, what was it? August 7th update. So um, just to be clear now, maybe in the future, they'll, they'll, they'll have it working on the older classrooms too. But so yes, um, unfortunately that doesn't work on the old classes. Okay, Tribe, it's time to share what's been going on on the blogs. And I have a post that I think will be particularly interesting to the listeners of the Google Teacher Tribe. I did a compilation post of 16 fantastic podcasts for teachers. So it's just a list of some of my favorites. I tell you, I couldn't fit all of my favorites in one list. So there might be like a part two to this one coming up as well. But if you're looking for some new educational podcasts to listen to, definitely go check out that list. I believe um, my my buddy, my co-host here has this other podcast too that you might be interested in. And it's on that list as well as, um, as, as some others. So, and some are relatively new that maybe you haven't heard of yet. So be sure that you go check that out. And I also want to announce, because this episode will release on Monday, October 1st, that October 2nd, I'm releasing a new course and it's called the Google Slides Masterclass. And, you know, Matt and I have no shortage of opinions when it comes to Google Slides, <laughs> right? That's so true. And, and sh yeah, yeah. The, the whole Swiss Army knife thing, if you want to see that come to life and learn all of those tips and tricks, that's what I've loaded into this course. It's not about how to create a presentation. It's about how to do all of those alternative things that we've been talking about. Yeah, that's that's going to be a killer course. And I was looking through your podcast post. There's a few of those in there that I didn't even know about. In fact, I did not know that Ed Surge has a podcast. That's one that I'm definitely going to have to check out. So uh, as far as posts go, there was one that caught my eye that I thought was really great. Uh, it was written by Meredith Akers, who is an elementary principal in Texas. And she wrote a post called Google Forms Plus – student self-reflection for coaching students to own their learning. And what I really like about this is that she ties this back to some of uh, John Hattie's best practices. And she notes that one of them, self-reported grades, has a very large effect size. And so she started thinking, how can we get at self-reflection? And so she mentions that in Weston Kieschnick's book, Bold School, he recommends using a Google form to have students answer one problem mid-lesson and then keep it anonymous and let them look at everybody else's responses and compare how they, they responded to it. So that way they kind of see where they are. But then Meredith goes a step further to talk about, she's basically got this whole lesson sequence of how to get students to practice and to check in and see how they're doing with all of these great reflective questions. I mean, she's got like dozens of these reflective questions that you can copy and paste right in. So this is a great post. Definitely go check it out. We do have the link, of course, in our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 59. All right, Tribe. So if you didn't have reason to go out and take a whole bunch of photos and videos or to have your students do that, now hopefully you do. Uh, if you haven't checked out Google Photos, this could be a really cool tool to start incorporating into your class, but definitely in your own life too. So let us know if you're using this, if you see some possibilities, go ahead and send us a tweet on the GT Tribe hashtag or head on over to googleteachertribe.com slash feedback and let us know because we do love to hear from you. 
We and we do try to to keep an eye on what's going on on Twitter, but we don't always see those. So if you go to the website and leave us either a comment in the form or a, or a voicemail, you're more likely to make it onto the show. So just thought that was worth mentioning because I know a lot of people um, get really excited to hear hear their names on the show. And you know, I, I think um, just be careful if you're driving. Don't get too excited. We, right. We've, we've had some reports of some close calls. So no, um, but no. We hope you really, you know, got some new ideas today. So there were some fantastic news and updates. There's always something cool going on. Go watch the dinosaur. Go go watch the volcano and get excited. And then, of course, if you haven't jumped into Google Photos, take a look at it. Um, let us know how you're using it and, and give us some more ideas, too, of different ways that you've been using it in the classroom. So, you know, thank you so much for joining us for episode 59. And I do have a quick favor to ask if you have not left us a review in iTunes, mm. yeah. please, please, please do so. Um, that really helps us find new teachers and new audiences who have maybe just never heard of the Google Teacher Tribe. So if you will... <gasps> <laughs> Not possible. That sounded like you were really scared. I kind of jumped. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep, I did it. That's yes, right. yes, it, we're, we're so excited. Super excited, right? Yes. Uh, how many times have we said that today? So thank you guys, and uh, we will catch you in the next episode. Bye, y'all. I'm supposed to keep going. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) I knew I was going to forget this new format. (laughs) It's okay. And I'm Casey. That's all I have to say. That's all. (laughs) Bye, (laughs) y'all. Okay. Okay, Chris. I will, I will add, I will give you the rest of that.